morning. All right, how many were here last week? All right, great, great, hands down. How many took the challenge and read those three verses, the prayer of Agur? Okay, all right, all right. How many had every intention to read them, really meant to, wanted to, but just didn't get around to doing it? So, okay, all right, thank you for being honest. It's okay, there's no shame in your game, it's okay. We are all on the same page. Today we are going to finish, we get to the gold. The prayer of Agur is three short verses. And it is the most overlooked prayer, I think, in all of Scripture. It is one of those things that is, if you look close, it has so much gold for us. It is, it is jam-packed with things that are going to make you uncomfortable and things that will inspire you, all within three short verses. We're going to read from the CSB translation this morning. We're going to start in verse 7. Go ahead and look there, Proverbs chapter 30, starting in verse 7, CSB translation. It says this, Two things I ask of you, don't deny them to me before I die. Keep falsehood and deceitful words far from me. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. Otherwise, I might have too much and deny you, saying, who's the Lord? Or I might have nothing and steal, profaning the name of my God. Now, I love that. I love the CSB because it's a very literal, literally almost a word-for-word -word translation from the original. Because we look at that, we can jump to the message and enjoy the way they phrase it. Check out the message. And then he prayed, God, I'm asking for two things before I die. Don't refuse me. Banish lies from my lips and liars from my presence. Give me enough food to live on, neither too much nor too little. If I'm too full, I might get independent. Oh my goodness, can you believe he used that word? I might get independent saying, God, who needs them? And if I'm poor, I might steal and dishonor the name of my God. Wow. The way that words, the way that that reads, do you understand what he just prayed? More importantly, can you honestly pray that prayer? Last week we studied Agur and we saw that he was a prophet, but we also saw that he was a list maker. He loved his list. He had five of them. And he always started out like, there's three things. Wait, no, nope, four. There's four things. Wait, no, nope, five. And he always had the, he would go on and on. And if you remember, the first thing he told us was seek God's purpose. That's a given, right? Not man's purpose, not my purpose, not even your purpose for your life, but seek God's purpose. The second one, appreciate God's undefinability. Ooh, I like this. Don't put God in a box. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Nobody puts God in a box. The third one, marvel at God's plan. We're going to come back to that at the end here today. Affirm God's authority. If we don't believe that the scripture is God's authority, what are we doing? Then it's just your opinion versus mine. Who cares? You know, I, me by myself have nothing good to say. It's because of God's word that we stand on a foundation that will stand the test of time. We affirm God's authority. And then the last one, anticipate God's eternity. This is what it's driving towards. This is what it's all about. It is heading to this moment where we know that all things will be made new, a new heavens and a new earth. We read about that in Revelation 20 and 21. And we know that this groaning, broken world will not have the final say. And we save the best for last, the buried treasure. Now, if you remember, I said when you live for God, you trust God, you discover his will, then we can actually live life in a very special zone. Anybody remember what it was called? Oh, who said it? That was right. Yeah, there you go. The sweet spot. If you forget, just think of my boy right here, old John McEnroe with the awesome hair. Anybody watch John McEnroe play growing up? Did anybody remember what he would say when the ref did something he disagreed with? All right, you cannot be serious. Surely you cannot. Well, we are serious, John. And don't call me Shirley. This is the time that Agur is very serious. Now, I want you to notice how he begins his prayer because it's brilliant. He says, Two things I ask of you, not 10, not five, two. Don't miss that. Notice how short and to the point he is. This is genius. This is not an accident, okay? This is your first nugget, okay? This isn't even in your notes. This is, anytime you can boil down your prayers, your request to God to simple, heartfelt requests, it is a benefit. See, we could bombard heaven with a thousand different things, and he would hear all prayers, but if he answered, how would you know? How does he get the glory? 
This is for our benefit. When we boil it down and we find ourselves more aware of God working in us and through us because he's answering individual specific prayer. Y'all, this is a great strategy for you. If your prayer life is struggling, boil it down to two or three things. See, if we drone on and on, which we like to do, we run the risk of doing what the Pharisees did. Remember what Jesus said? He called them out and says, don't be like them. They drone on and on, blah, 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 thinking they will be heard for their many words. There's the actual quote. And Jesus says, don't be like that. Boil it down. See what you want. Then you can track God's response. You can give him glory, which is where this is all leading. Our life is supposed to reflect his glory. He's so clear and he's so concise. And I love it. He pours out his heart. He boils it down to just two things. So what are the two things that Agur asked for? He identifies them right there. Did you notice that? If you look close, his two weaknesses, you might say, his two struggles, number one is discerning truth. And the second one is trusting God to provide for his needs. In other words, not letting stuff or things or even simple things like food, not letting that rule his life. All right, so let's tackle the first one first. First one, discerning truth from lies. Agar prays, verse 8, look at it. Keep falsehood and deceitful words far from me. You can almost hear Agar if you lean in and just read his thoughts, his thought process. He's saying, God, I know this world is filled with lies. I know there's truth, but I know there's so much deception out there. And there are people who are intentionally trying to trip me up, and I fall for it way too often. It could be the media. It could be a group of friends. It could be the culture. It could be anything that stands apart from God's truth. And he knows that. He's saying, would you please protect my ears from hearing lies? Don't let me go down that road that is the wrong path. Keep my lips from lying so I don't deceive others. And keep people who lie and bring me down, keep them far from me. Now, Edgar is on to something so genius, so simple right here. Truth matters. Truth matters today. In a day where people don't want to acknowledge that there even is objective truth, truth matters. Truth can be known. It is in God's word. Truth not only can be known, but we can embrace it. It is objective. In fact, when we embrace it, it literally sets us free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Satan, however, the father of lies, wants to obscure truth. He wants you to fiddle around the edges just a little bit. Say, well, did God really say that? I mean, come on, look, I mean, you know what God meant here, right? I mean, did he really say you will die? It's the very first question he asked in the Garden of Eden. Notice it wasn't like an outright blatant lie, like blaspheme God and curse him and die. Just a little thing. You, you'll, you'll be like him. All he did was show up, plant a little seed of doubt, walk away, and we took it from here. And that was enough. We've been paying for that for that moment. Look how well that worked out for us in the garden. All he did was show up and just distort a little, just obscure the truth just a little bit. But it's his next part that is so shocking to me. Agar's next part, his request here is a stunner. I'm going to give you a warning, okay? If we're honest, this next part is probably going to make us a little uncomfortable. It probably should, all right? Because he dares to pray for, wait for it, a life of moderation. Wait, what? A life of moderation? No, no, no. You mean a life of excellence. You mean a life of, woo, let's go. Woohoo, shoot them up. Let's go. We're wide open. No. A life of moderation. What is that? That's not on anybody's checklist. Go to the library and check out a book called Great Moderates in History. <laughs> right? You won't find it. You know, it's, nobody, nobody claims as a campaign slogan, make America moderate again. You know, build back moderately. It, that doesn't, that, that's not inspiring. Yet Agar shows up and says, God, I want things in moderation. It certainly isn't on my list when I look at what America teaches me. I mean, in this 21st century, we are living in the age of extremes. Look at this short prayer again, okay? I'm going to tweak the translation to a little bit different one. I think it might be the NIV. And I want you to let it sink in just how radical it is. Read it with me. He says this, please don't give to me wealth or poverty, God. I ask only for a lot. Oh, wait. Just enough. Remember last week? Goldilocks. It was just right. I asked for just enough. Can you mean that? 
See, I'm okay with the don't give me poverty part. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's that don't give me wealth part that flies in the face of everything I was brought up to chase in the American dream. Wow, it's awfully quiet in here. I hope online at home, wherever you are, you're shouting and you're, you're knowing that that's the truth. <laughs> don't give me wealth. Don't give me, I'm not chasing after that, God. Just give me enough. Is this hitting anyone else right in the fields? I mean, right in the core of your feelings? Think about everything the world tries to sell us today. Bigger's better. More. More houses. More cars. More raises. More closet space. More activities. More shelves so you can put the trophies of the activities that we go and win. More toys. More responsibilities. So we go more, more, more. But there's a flip side. And this is kind of weird because this flip side, I'm actually seeing it's another extreme and the pendulum has swung back a lot of good people. There's an entire subculture who are choosing to live as minimalists. Have you noticed that? And I'm talking more than just the little tiny houses and stuff. Maybe you know someone who leans this way a little harder. Maybe they're not like just cutting up the clutter and you know, moving a few things out. They're like hardcore. They are against anything new. They don't want any gadgets. They don't want any of the fancy houses, fancy cars. They couldn't care less about their fashion. Their entire wardrobe fits in a Walmart bag. You know what I'm talking about? It's one color, one shirt. It's all I don't have to think about it. These are the ones who share the micro apartments. They don't even live by themselves. They bring somebody in to share those 200 square feet, and they live in these tiny homes. And I briefly touched on this last week as a joke, not knowing how prophetic this would be, when I said... Agar's not necessarily decreeing all of us should go live in a van down by the river. But when I Googled it, there are people literally wanting to live in a van down by the river. These are, it's even got a hashtag. This is tw trending on Twitter, millennial retirement plans. Chris Farley not included. Live in a van down by the river. See, some say minimalism is the next generation's response to the previous generation's consumerism. That they are rebelling against the consumerism of their evil generation forefathers, right? And if you study history, y'all, this is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. Every generation, the pendulum swings one way. And then it might not be the following one, but it might be two generations back. The pendulum swings. Some of you are not because you know you've lived long enough to see this. You've seen these cycles go back and forth. Jay Payleitner, he's the guy who wrote this book called The Prayer of Agar. It's, it's, it's an incredible book. And he breaks this down. And he offers this brief history lesson. He says this, the men and women who grew up in the Great Depression fought World War II. They came to be known as the greatest generation. When they started their families, they were the very first generation to buy TVs, a second car, a house in the suburbs, and suddenly everything was better and faster. Interstate highways, we see commercial jetliners, we see the glorious fast food TV dinners, right? And we gather around the family, because by the way, TV adds so much family happiness. It's wholesome. It's good for you. There's so much good stuff out there now. My, how times have changed. Some of us lived through this generation. We saw this, and we, we see the humor in this. I mean, it, we, at this point, we have arrived. It's good for you, right? He goes on to say this. The greatest generation wasn't motivated by greed. They were building a better life for their families, for their kids, the boomers, right? And the boomers got a taste of it. They rebelled for a little while, but they came back and they would inherit this taste for bigger and faster and busier and more expensive. And then the next generation, Gen Xers, <clears throat> saw all the fancy stuff and enjoyed it, all the things their parents had that they had worked 40 years for, and the Gen Xers wanted it now. They, they didn't want to wait. They, I'm not waiting 40 years. I'm 21. I know it all. I got a degree. Let's go. Bring it on. And guess what? If you can't afford it and work for it for 30, 40 years, no problem. You can just put it on credit, right? At 23%. It's a win-win, baby. You help the banks because they're hurting. And you help yourself. You can enjoy it while you pay for it. And the next generation realized somebody got to pay that. And he realized, you know what? All this stuff was not geared towards true godly contentment. It brought debt and stress and fatigue and broken marriages and heartbreak and despair. Looking back, we see overindulging, overspending, overconsuming. Maybe that's not the best idea. But it actually makes that minimalist life look kind of good. Can I say that? I'm not a minimalist by any means, but I see 
why they may see this as attractive. But if you look at what Agar is saying, look closely. He is not endorsing either extreme. He's not endorsing saying wealth is your your path to success and, and, and purpose. But he's also not saying you need to live in a van down by the river. He's not saying fast or slow is better, big or small, fancy or simple. Really, if you look closely, Agar is endorsing a life of contentment, a balance. Or, in other words, living in God's sweet spot. It is the perfect mixture of getting what you need and needing what you get. And he sums it up so nicely. He says, Lord, would you just give me enough? Don't let me be lazy, sit in a hammock and just wait on a check to show up, not do anything, not fulfill my purpose, not do anything that that, that benefits the kingdom, but also don't help me become a spastic, panic-buying hoarder. And we smile because we say, well, that's... That's 3,000 years ago. We don't do that. We would never do that. You know, we don't, we don't hoard things. Let me show you something, folks. I'm not even going to say a word. Okay? Got this on the camera at home? You say, well, Pastor, that's just, that was a year ago. You know, we don't hoard stuff like, oh, mm, I'm crying baloney. Some of you got a stockpile at home right now. You know you do. You'll never have to buy this again. If this ever goes in fashion, you are set for life. You can take market share, open your own company, okay? And you say, well, Pastor, that's just one thing. I mean, everybody's got to have it eventually, right? <laughs> I hope it doesn't disintegrate over the next eight years that you're whittling your stockpile down. We say, well, that, that was a year ago. We, don't, we, we would never do anything like that. You know, more recently, we would... I'm just going to set that right there. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look at us. We're no smarter than Agar. We do the same thing, ginned up by media or whoever's whispering in your ear that the end of the world is coming. There's no hope, not even with God. You better stockpile and go get a cave, hide out. So we would never do this. Are you kidding? Y'all, within 72 hours of a whisper, 72% of North Carolina gas stations were out of gas. That's not somewhere in some crazy state. That's here. That's our home state. We're supposed to be the smart state. You know, we're not Alabama. Wait, what? I didn't say that. (laughs) Alabama picks on Mississippi. Mississippi picks on Louisiana. I get everybody has, you know. If you think that we're above this, look at what it drove us to do in the 73rd and the 74th hour. People got creative about how to hoard their gasoline. Hey, you don't have a container like this? No problem, get a Walmart bag. Or better yet, get your laundry bin. Hey, that'll help. What are we doing? Do you see why Agar's wisdom is so timeless? Why we need to know these things? People are looking, and when you want to stand up for truth, the biblical context of what Agar's saying here, everyone he was writing to would have known immediately what he's talking about. You know why? Because they knew God's word. They knew the Torah. And they would connect this immediately to Exodus and God providing manna for those 40 years that they wanted. If you're new to the faith and you don't understand that, the Israelites were hungry and they were desperate and they were leaning on God. And God showed up and provided a daily amount of food called manna, the angel's bread. What is this? It was crazy. And they could go gather it every day, just what they needed. And if they gathered too much, It would spoil and rot, all wormy and maggot. It was gross. It was disgusting. Isn't that true of so much of what we do today? Think about this. We don't need too much, not too little. There is a balance. Otherwise, whatever you're doing goes off the rails. Things spoil. But when you are faithfully trying to live in God's sweet spot, his provision, his balance, it is more than sufficient. In other words, where God guides, he provides. See, when you are seeking him and you are trying to live for him and you are walking in that Sweet spot. He has a promise never to leave you nor forsake you. And we don't believe that. We're we're dangerously dependent on making sure our nest egg is what we want. We're making sure we we, we take care of myself. Don't worry about these other people. And I'm going to do some things just for myself. Y'all, I'm not talking about just financially here. I can't wait to share with you a story of what happened just this week when God blew my mind. I'm going to come back to that. But when you are faithfully trying to live in God's sweet spot, it is radical. His provision, his balanced life applies to every area of your life. It goes beyond finances. Think about exercise, everybody's favorite topic. Everybody loves to exercise. The amount of exercise we should all get has a balance. There are extremes, right? One extreme would be living at the gym. 
tearing off your shirt like Hulk Hogan, becoming a roid rage maniac, turning green, whatever. And the other extreme would be this guy here who says, yeah, abs are cool, but have you ever tried stuffed crust pizza? I mean, <laughs> that is awesome, right? That's the other side, being a couch potato and doing nothing. There is a balance. Think about work. The extremes are not even looking for a job, not even trying to live up to your potential, or the flip side, becoming a workaholic, disappearing for weeks, days, hours, months on end, neglecting your family, having your kids grow up overnight and suddenly you're a stranger, neglecting your church, neglecting your kingdom purpose, being so insider focused that you don't notice God's mission. Think about our hobbies, how much we spend time. Ask yourself, has my hobby become an out of control, unhealthy obsession? Is it just maxing out my credit cards? Is it maxing out every free moment I have? And now I'm cut off from the world. I'm cut off from my family. In fact, it's all I think about Monday through Friday. I can't wait to get to the weekend and just disappear and unplug from everything. That's out of balance. You know, is it something that maybe hopefully makes you a better person? It refreshes you so that you're restored and now you can be a blessing to your family, to your spouse, to your children, to your church. See how important it is to find balance. Anger, very very specifically says your daily bread. No more, no less. Your finances, your health, your relationships, activities, emotions, all of it has a balance. Even your marriage, romance, think about this. This is supposed to be a husband and wife coming together, mutually finding that balance to meet each other's needs. Balance and contentment applies to every area, and Agur knew that. And he says it very plainly, God, please provide my daily needs. No more, no less. Now, I want you to think about this. Today, we recognize a very similar phrase from the Lord's Prayer. It was delivered by Jesus, and he said this, give us this day our daily bread, right? Very similar to Agur's prayer, right? But only the difference is Agur wrote this a thousand years before Jesus came. And we recognize these words from Jesus, and we think, oh, I'm comfortable with that. I like that. I believe in that. And we nod, and we think, yeah, that's good. God, provide our needs. Go get them, God. You take care. I sort of trust you. I mean, I trust you. And we, we're very happy with that. The only problem is... That's not what Agur prayed. Wait, what? I thought that was the same. No. Look closer. Agur adds one single word. He adds the word only. This changes everything. Y'all, this is next level discipleship. Can you really pray that? This little word introduces an entirely deeper level of trust to the one who provides. It takes serious courage to say, God, give me only my daily bread. Wow. I thought he's going to get uncomfortable, right? This, let's ask the honest question here. Who on earth would pray that prayer? I don't want to pray that prayer. Maybe you don't want to pray that prayer either because God give me only my daily bread is a scary place to be. Agur, I think, answers my question. Why would you pray that? Have you lost your mind? Don't you know that's dangerous? Look at what he says, reading in verse 9. He says this. Here's his answer. See, if I'm too full, I might get independent, saying, God, I mean, who really needs them? And if I'm poor, well, I might steal and dishonor the name of my God. Right there, Agur identifies his weakness. He's so open and candid, and I appreciate that. I'm not judging him for it. He says, my specific thing, that my downfall is things and stuff and materialism. He knew if he had too much, he might pridefully take credit. Pull away from the things that are mattering the most. I don't need God after all. Be honest. You know somebody that's just like this. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's a family member. We all know good people who have been blessed. By the world standards, they might even be wealthy. They've done so well. God has blessed them so much. Literally, they have all they need. They've been so richly blessed. Honestly, it is easy for them to not really need anything. And they get lulled into a false sense of security. And they kind of operate independent of God. If I'm too full, I might get, and there it is, I might get independent saying, God, who really needs them? I've got everything I need. We know good people like this. I don't blame them. I get it. I could be there, but for the grace of God, that's me. You know people in your business world. You know people in your family. Here in the church world, this is what I know. We know people like that. 
You can't lean on them. They can't serve. They can't be in leadership positions because they'll show up one week, be excited, and then they'll disappear for two or three or four at the beach or at the lake or at the ski chalet or wherever. I don't know. FBI can't find half of them. And you're like, you wonder why you don't feel connected. You don't feel plugged in. It's because you're not coming to the source to plug in, being with these people, meeting people, taking them out to lunch after church and saying, hey, I saw you're new. Can I come and find you? At best, they're inconsistent. And you cannot advance the kingdom in absentia. If you're absent, you can't be used. You can't be do. See, I applaud Agar's self-awareness here. Slow clap to Agar. Good for him. A little breakfast club action right here. He at least knows his downfall. In essence, he's saying, God, will you keep me dependent on you? Keep me plugged in so I know the kingdom is what I live for. When I pray your kingdom come, I'm not just giving you lip service, but I mean it. And I'm passionate. I have complete trust in you. I want to live in your sweet spot. And I can't do life without you. I dare not do life without you. Which leads us to our last takeaway. The hidden secret of where all this prayer is leading. Contentment leads to empowerment. Mm -mm -mm. This is so good. Having more than we need, that's a trap. Having less than we need, both extremes will cause difficulty. Somewhere in between is the beautiful concept he is talking about. And that is contentment. So ask yourself a question. You can sit back and relax just for one second. Ask yourself honestly, am I a contented person? Take a minute, do an inventory, find your answer. Yes, no, maybe. Am I living with godly contentment? See, my job as pastor, right, to challenge us, right, to make things uncomfortable, to prod us a little bit, get us out of our comfort nest. The theme of contentment is all over Scripture. There is an encouragement here, and probably the most well-known passage is one of your favorites, Philippians 4.12. He says this, I know what it is to be in need. Most of us know that. And I know what it is to have plenty. Some of us know that. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's Philippians. You say, oh, pastor, I love Philippians. Philippians is my favorite. It's the joyful book. It's like, woo, I read Warren Wearsby. I know all about this. This is be joyful. This is the part where we're so excited. We're content. You know what, pastor? My all-time favorite verse is somewhere also in Philippians. You probably know it. It's this one right here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And we say, we nod our head and go, yeah, that's a good verse. Man, I get that. That's awesome. And it is a great verse. There's just one problem with this verse. 99% of the time it's quoted, it's taken out of context. You ready for your truth grenade? Nod if you're with me. All right, here we go. This is your hidden gold, your hidden gem, okay? I want you to look closer at that verse. Do you see it? Look close. Maybe not at the photo. Although, I applaud that guy. He's so brave. Hanging off a mountainside. See, when I think I can do all things through Christ, I want to hang and climb a mountain on one hand with no rope, no safety harness, no one on belay. Look closer. I'll give you a hint. Don't look at the picture and don't even look at the verse. Look at the zip code. Y'all, when I connected these dots this week, it blew my mind. Are you ready for this? Think about this. Agar is praying this. And when, when Paul writes this a thousand years later, I can do all things, that verse comes immediately after reading about the secret of being content. So when Paul says he's uncovered the secret of being content, he is literally telling you, guys, I have found the launch pad for doing great things. I have found the source, the secret. The secret of my strength is humbly trusting God for my needs, even my daily provision. Okay, the two are inseparable. So knowing that proper context, read it again with the full context put together. He says this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Do you see that? Y'all, that, wow, that changes everything about how we've quoted that verse. This is in relationship to contentment. This is the secret. Paul is saying, how cool is it that Paul and Agar, who lived a thousand years apart, are on the exact same page? Isn't God's word awesome? Isn't God amazing? God's not impressed with my Rolex. 
God's not impressed with my resume. He's not impressed with your washboard abs, your corner office, or your collection of rare garden gnomes. None of that impresses him. It's not about that. He loves you. He is inviting you into his sweet spot because that's where you find peace and purpose. All that stuff you're chasing all over the world, it's found in your creator. It's found. That's where your purpose and your contentment, living in God's sweet spot, in his will. It's not boring. It is empowering. It is the whole, the achingness that you have looked for. It is there. We draw near to God. We rest in him. We trust in him. It's the one place that you can launch a career from. It's the one place you can build your marriage. It's the one place you can plan your new business venture, that big, bold dream you want to have for your education or your family. But bouncing off the guardrails, going from one extreme to the other, that will never offer lasting peace. Running frantically, chasing this high or this high or this vacation spot, that will never be satisfying because that is not what you're missing. By choosing to live a life that is depending on God and God alone, you become more like him. So you know I got to ask, do you really want that? See, we pray that prayer. God, I just want to be more like you. Make me more like you, Jesus. At the end of this all, I stand before you. I don't be judged by the word. I want to hear you say, well done, good, and faithful servant. Not good and blessed servant. Not good and stockpiled servant. Good and faithful servant. We are more like him. And you start to learn the ability to know right from wrong. It sharpens. You can see things clearly through the lens of scripture and be able to call, that's wrong, that's right, that's hateful, this is love. You'll be able to see things clearly because you are walking on the journey. You have a clear vision for the path ahead. The sun comes out, it shines, and all those aggravating obstacles no longer derail you. They're just slightly annoying. And you remember your purpose because trusting God gives you that clear vision. It gives you that purpose. Remember, he is for you. And he genuinely loves you. He's not trying to hide from you. I think so many people have bought into the lie from the enemy that God is capricious and that following his will is somehow bewildering and like shrouded in mystery. As if God is looking down on us going, I have great plans for you, but I'm not going to tell you. And we giggle, but that's how we live. God, I don't understand what you want for me to do. I don't understand. Why are you hiding from me? I think we, we buy this lie that living for God is backbreaking and arduous and tedious and unfulfilling as if God is some big grumpy cat in the sky who just wants us to be miserable. That's not God. That's not grumpy cat. Either. That's mad cat. Something happened to him. God's not like that. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to end a little differently. I'm going to go ahead and have the musicians come up. I want to share something with you. As we settle into God's will, we start having the confidence to put ourselves out there. We start trusting him in ways we dared not ever do before. And we finally understand God will provide for our needs. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all, right? We hear this. We know it. When you start walking that, knowing that he cares for you, he loves you right where you are, the pressure is off. You don't have to perform for him. You have nothing to prove, and you can start to dream dreams again. You can start to explore life without panicking. Embrace these successes and your failures because he loves you when your cup's full, and he loves you when your cup's empty, which is great. Don't you wish we had human friends that were always there like that? God is awesome. You remember earlier when I said where he guides, he provides. I want to show you what I mean, a true life story that only a handful of you know about until this moment. Last week, really over the last three weeks, I've been sharing the vision that God has laid on our heart for our church to embrace the kingdom mindset. And we took a bold, giant leap of faith to step out in faith and follow his command to embrace the Great Commission, to not just be insider-focused, but to intentionally turn and be outsider-focused, to look for those who are hurting, to look for those who are desperate. To look for those who are perishing without knowing the Savior. To be a great commission church, a mission-minded church, involved and invested in missions, not just overseas, but here in our own Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. I want to be that church, the church that's great commissioned and the church that's thriving and sending. We see that in the book of Acts. We see, you will be my witnesses. I'm pouring out the Holy Spirit on this generation. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. 
the original church in Acts, the church that we founded this based on in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. So taking this mandate seriously, we took a bold step. We expanded our local mission support to come alongside a brand new church start that needed help. They're launching in September. You know about Grace City Church. It's a much needed area of North Carolina that is underserved. And us, along with five other churches similar in size to us that couldn't do it alone, have pooled our resources together and are now doing something that we would never have done otherwise. And I love it, man. There is hardcore, frontline missions and evangelism needed where this church is being started. And they, I was so proud of you guys after I shared that vision. Almost every single person walked by, high five, gave me a pound, fist bump, I'm in, pastor, let's go. Whatever it takes, may we be a great commission sending church. I think we realize the American church is stagnant at best. When 80% of the cars are in the driveway this morning, and less than 20 are fulfilling his command to gather before they can be sent. 80%. What we've done the last 50 years hasn't moved the needle. It's been good. It's been good for us. It's been good for the insiders, but it hasn't moved the needle. In fact, we've lost ground to the enemy, and we see that in stat after heartbreaking stat. So we took a step of faith, and our church wrote its first missions check to support this effort Monday morning. Linda's smiling because she knows what's about to happen. Now remember, when we took the step of faith, there was no line item for this. This has never been budgeted before. Okay? It's not like we got a little bit of silence. Let's just direct a little bit over here. No one will miss it. It's just something we should do. A church should tithe. I believe in that. We haven't been able to do that for years. I said, Linda, let's do it. Monday morning, here's what I want you to do. We wrote the check on Monday morning, and then I looked at her. I said, Linda, I want you to make this a recurring automatic offering every month of missions. It's the right thing to do. We're not going to fight this battle every month. We're not going to walk in and go, should we do this or not? That was a low offering. I don't think we could, you know, and the devil come and whisper and say, what are you doing? Just stop that. Stay content. So I made that great declaration very boldly. Felt good about it for the eight steps it took to get back to sit at my desk. No sooner had I sat down, I look at the receipts and I'm looking at things. I'm like, Phew, uh. and then I could almost hear the faint whisper of the enemy saying, what if God doesn't come through? I mean, do you know what you've committed that church to? was a stupid day. Who's that sound like? And I was the enemy. No sooner had I, had I made that bold declaration to step out of faith. We are going to do it. It is the right thing to do, God. We are stepping out in faith and obedience to you to obey your command and the whisper of the enemy. But then I remembered his mandate. And then I remembered that where he guides, he provides. And God was about to remind me of that. Just hours later, it's time to check the mail. It's right out here, right on the other side of Phil. I'm walking, I got my key, and I'm kind of dreading this because Monday morning I open out, it's packed full of bills. Got to pay the bills, right? Don't you love those? They're your favorite. Open up the mailbox, there's a stack of them. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to look at this. <laughs> here you go, Linda, right? So I take it to the main office, going through them, and I'm like, oh, hey, that's not a bill. Look at that, that's an offer. I hadn't seen that person in a year. Look at them, they said, oh, God bless them. That's, that's handwritten, that's not a bill. That's not a bill. That's, that's an offering. That's a tithe check. That's an auto pay. Where are the bills? Why is there so yeah. Hang on. <laughs> I'm going to try to get through this. I'm looking through them, and I'm thinking, there's not a single bill in this stack. There's not a single bill in this stack. Wouldn't it be just like God to gently... Remind me and encourage. Just a little pat pat, just a little spank. Boop, boop. To remind him he's in charge. To remind me that he's in charge. And I said, you know what? Here we are, and I'm looking. This is offering check after offering check after another one after rent check. We even had a renter who borrows our, our facility. The, the Russian preschool wrote their monthly rent check for way more than they needed to. I've never done that before. I wonder what's going on. And I start looking at this. I'm like, oh, I got to tell Linda about this. I mean, wouldn't it be just like God to cover that exact amount the same day to provide the five or $600 that we just stepped out? Y'all, when we were done adding up what came in the mail, it wasn't just enough. It wasn't double. It wasn't triple. When we were done counting this up, it was 
10 times the amount we had just written. God had blessed us tenfold what we had tried to outdo him and bless others. Tenfold. Church, you can't outgive God. It was so amazing. When you are walking in obedience with him and you are living in his sweet spot. Now, here's the kicker. I think it was Hayden that reminded me of this. I shared this with some of our leadership team. And I said, you're not going to believe this. He started tearing up. He goes, Matt, for that to have happened on that Monday when you stepped out in faith and you did what God asked for you, that, that act of obedience, means God was aware of that. He had to move three days, four days, five days in advance to play it on their heart, to write those checks, to get them to the mail. That's not fast. To show up on a Monday morning, not random through the week, but all at one time. To add a zero to the check we just wrote. Because where God guides, he provides it is a biblical promise we can claim. And it's not just financially. It's in every area of our life. So church, I know this is hard. Remember, everything that spanks you spanked me all week long first. Are you ready to step up in bold faith? Today is your day. His timing is unreal. God is pouring out his favor on a remnant. For those who are serious, those who are done playing culture church, those who are more concerned with pleasing people or being woke rather than in his word, it is time for us to be known as people of the word where we actually step up and we believe this. I just looked at that and I smiled. I texted Linda. I said, Linda, I know you're, you're making the deposit. When you come back, it's going to blow your mind. You can't outgive God. He is our provider. He is our Abba Father. And maybe you just needed a reminder of his faithfulness and his love today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to sing our last song of worship. We're going to open the altar. Maybe you want to come and pray your version of the prayer of Agar. Maybe you're a new relationship just starting out. You want to build that on that foundation. Maybe you're older. you got kids, family members. Maybe you've got lost people. and You saw the baptism today. You're thinking, I want to be known that I am all in. The altar's open. Come do business with the Lord. No one will bother you. This is your moment. This is the highlight. These last two weeks, it's been leading to this moment. God, I believe in you. You are my provider. And I will step out in faith and walk in that today. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. You can sing. You can make where you are an altar of worship. You can come and kneel. No one will bother you. Just be obedient today to what God is laying on your heart as he works.